Praise the Lord, everybody. I have my mask in my hand, and it's the first good breath I've had all morning. And the fog is getting, I feel like I'm standing in Niagara Falls. Glasses are steamed up and so on. What a privilege and what an honor to be here today. What a beautiful crowd. Amen. Thank you, Brother Woodward, Brother Lehman, for this privilege. And it is a privilege and an honor for us to be here today. Praise the Lord. And uh, I want to say that uh, a few weeks ago, we, uh, we were in Newfoundland. Brother Farrell and I were there. They, they didn't have a presbyter. They didn't have a conference. They didn't have a camp meeting. And uh, it was looking pretty discouraged. So I had lunch with Pastor Farrell at his house. And I said, Brother Dave, I'm not happy with this. Those dear people in Newfoundland, they can't get a preacher from, big preacher from the States because of Mr. COVID. And I'm not happy about that. And I said, I think you and I could do something about it. And he said, well, I got a lot on the plate. So he tried to go to bed and all night long, the Lord dealt with him. So he called me next morning and he said, I've been talking to the superintendent about it. And he said, superintendent wants us to go to Newfoundland. And we went to Newfoundland. And we had nine of the most, most precious days preaching their camp meeting and, and being with the saints of the Lord. Amen. And while we were there in July, the, perhaps the 20th, the phone rang and it was Pastor Woodward. And he said, Brother Lewis, got a question for you. I said, yeah. And I got an answer for you too. What's your question? He said, I'd like for you to come and be with us for our Heritage Sunday at Capital Community Church on this day. And I said, yes. Yes, indeed, I'll be there. And yes, indeed, I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> Praise God. And I will say this, that I'm delighted to have my bride with me. I came to Fredericton to Bible College in 1960. Drove into town with an old broken down car. Coming to Bible College. 60 years ago. This church wasn't here. We went to the church in Argyle Street, Pastor Jake's. And we were there at that service when they opened the Bible College for that year, 1960. And my wife was there, but she was working at the bank in Harvey and she wasn't going to be coming for a couple of weeks. She had to work her notice. She said, I came to that service. Why don't you go ahead and sit down? <laughs> I heard your prayer. <clears throat> and she said, I was there that night, and they introduced the first-year students of you. Please stand. And she said, I remember you. She said, you had your hands in the air, and you were shouting, and you were jumping up and down. And she said, I, I remember you. See, it, it was a done deal. She, she had me in her sights. And uh, we, we eventually got together and married. And that was 58 years ago, about three, three weeks ago. 58 years. Thank you. And I'm delighted that she's here today, and, and I'd like for her to come up and greet us, Sister, Sister Cole. <laughs> I walked to the kitchen after our anniversary, and I said, uh, good morning, Mrs. Lewis. And I said, we couldn't say that back a week ago, but we can say it now. Then I looked at her, and I said, 
you know, you could have done worse. <laughs> I had to remind her. I said, you could have done worse. And then I said, of course, you could have done better. And she looked at me and said, I don't think I could have done any better. <laughs> That's why I'm keeping her around. I'd like you to greet us, dear. Praise the Lord, everyone. It's a real privilege to be here today at Capital Community Church. And I give honor to your pastors, Brother and Sister Woodward and Brother and Sister Lehman. Happy birthday, Brother Lehman. And uh, I give honor to the Cole family today and the new addition. So great to have you all here. And God is good. And uh, I'm so thankful for the way the Lord has led my life. And... Uh, it's a great privilege to be in the work of God. Um, I want, also want to give honor today to two special ladies here. Sister Beverly Woodward, and I feel I have a real connection with these two ladies. Sister Beverly Woodward and I share the same birthday, June the 1st. And Sister Kathy Lehman, I have a special connection with you because it was your grandparents and great-grandparents who with the McAdam Church brought the gospel to Harvey. And I heard the gospel for the first time and was baptized, received the Holy Ghost back in 1948. And that's many years ago. But God has been faithful. And uh, I want to close with the scripture. 1 Timothy 1, 19 to 20 says, Holding faith and a good conscience which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. Now, it's been 72 years, I think, since I started serving the Lord. And yes, I've had questions. Yes, I have not understood everything. There have been times I said, why? Why, Lord? Why did this happen? And maybe there are no answers. But I, I can say today that my, I still have my faith in God. I believe in God. He is real, and he, he will never forsake us. I'm so thankful I have not lost my faith in God, and I have not made shipwreck of my life. I've known people who just, they just throw up their hands and said, I'm done. I'm done with church. I'm not going back there anymore because I don't understand what happened, why this happened. But today I have questions or things I don't understand, but I'm glad my faith in God is still strong. And I mean to keep true to the end. God bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Lewis. We're still together. And what an honor it is for us to be here. And my daughter and her husband are going to be here tonight. I understand. Not wonderful. Not wonderful to drive in here so many years ago with nothing. All I had was the Holy Ghost and I had a desire. Come in here and 60 years later, here I'm standing in one of the great pulpits and my little daughter's going to be here tonight singing. Talk about a blessed man. Talk about Thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. This lovely wife, I have four wonderful children, and they're all very, very sharp and uh, gainfully employed. And uh, I have a number of grandchildren, I think five. And I have uh, three and a half dogs. I've got three dogs and another one on the way. As <laughs> soon as COVID will let us go and get him, we're going to have another dog. I love dogs. I love dogs. Now, as far as cats are concerned, that's a different story. One day, I saw a cat going with a baby bird in its mouth, and... Uh, that little bird had its mouth open calling for help. And I ran after the cat 
and it stayed just far enough ahead of me that I couldn't catch it. And I declared a truce that day that I'm not a cat lover, <laughs> but I do love dogs. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Brother Woodward and Sister Woodward. And I want to say that you, uh, you've, you've done it right by selecting us. You've done it right. <clears throat> this heritage thing. I, uh, as was said, we have 100 years uh, in Perth. And uh, 50 years ago this weekend, we arrived in Perth. <laughs> 50 years ago. And we've had, we've had a wonderful time. So very thankful for that. And uh, so I said to the pastor, I said, listen, on that 100th anniversary, I want you to come to the east wing of the manor and get me. And I want to come and preach that Sunday morning. And he did. I wasn't in the manor, but he did come and get me. <laughs> and I preached that Sunday morning. And I did such a good job there that I uh, went to Upper Kent last Sunday and celebrated their 70th anniversary with Pastor and Sister Hathaway and the Doucettes. And 70 years there. Then I got to go to McAdam and their octogenarians there. They got a wonderful church. We had a great weekend in McAdam. And now here I am here. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I want to talk this morning about heritage. And I want to talk about uh, my legacy. I've been, always, I've been concerned lately about my legacy. That is... How am I going to be remembered? How are you going to be remembered? Uh, what kind of a testimony are we leaving behind? And I'll tell you, that's sobering. My wife and I walked through a cemetery recently. And as we passed by a number of headstones, inscriptions and names and dates, there were some headstones that I had to stop and remember and to contemplate the life that they had lived for the work of God. And then I thought, how are people going to remember me? Have I been a failure? I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus? And uh, that, that was a while ago, but it's still that today. I still want my legacy so that when people look upon Harry Lewis, when he's gone, and I'm 78 years old, and I know I don't look it. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, but I've, I'm older now than my instructors were at Bible College when I came. And uh, I've said goodbye to some dear friends. Had a request from a ministerial couple, the husband it's just celebrated 80 years, and uh, the church was having a surprise party for them after the morning service, and they got in touch with me and said, Brother Lewis, you graduated with him. Would you send us a message uh, that we can read at his surprise party? And after the service, they had their, and I told him that he would make an excellent octogenarian whatever that is. And uh, so we're getting up there. And, and one day it's, it's all going to be over. We're going to be gone. But it's very important to me what kind of a testimony I've left behind. Amen. Amen. Praise God. One more thing I need to say before we stand and read our scripture. I know that this is a uh, perhaps a different style service. The Lord laid this on my heart yesterday as I was walking, praying about the service. And the Lord said, you can't be forgetful of the one lost sheep. There might be somebody in that service. This is over and over in my ministry, over and over. 
would come down three quarters away to the service. And then I would get to, in my spirit, get to reaching for somebody. Jesus said a man had a hundred sheep and one was lost. And he left the 99 in the wilderness and went out and went searching. And maybe there's somebody here this morning that you've lost your way. And maybe, maybe your, uh, your testimony is not as good. And your legacy is not where it should be. But this morning, that can be turned around. And I don't know who's watching on multimedia. I don't know who. But the Lord told me to reach a hand out. Reach a hand out. Maybe there's somebody that one time knew the Lord and walked with the Lord. And uh, their legacy is not as good. And they don't know uh, when the time is going to come, when it's all going to be over. But I want to have a testimony that he pleased God. Praise God. Praise God. Would you stand, please? And I'm reading from Psalm 16. Psalm 16 and verse 5. Praise the Lord. Thank you for standing. The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen to me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My reigns also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. Praise the Lord. Lord, for your word this morning, we give you thanks. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful privilege that you've afforded me to be here in this great congregation, such a good number. Oh, God, and I pray that our hearts will be challenged, Lord, today as we put our trust in you and look to you. Have your way in the remainder of this service. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Heritage and legacy. He said, David said, I have a goodly heritage. And I have uh, overlooked this, verse 6, the A part. The lines are fallen to me in pleasant places, and I have a goodly heritage. I think perhaps the reference about the lines is when they crossed the Jordan River and came into Canaan's land, Joshua and them, and you can find this in the middle chapters of the book of Joshua, where the people were allotted sections of land. And here it talks about it and calls it, uh, the lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage and mine inheritance and thou maintainest my lot. And I think he was, I think he was referring to the lines that was designated to him uh, in, in the land that they had. And, and the psalmist said, I, the lines are fallen to me in pleasant places. And I can say, I can say on this Thanksgiving Sunday that the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Uh, there are so many wonderful things that's happened to me and to you. And I think we need to remember that this morning, uh, being thankful that the, the lines God has allowed them to fall to us. And uh, I am very thankful for that. Amen. And I, uh, 50 years ago today, and I had mentioned about Perth Church. And from the 60 years when I drove into town, I drove in and I was scared. And I saw the cotton mill and I said, that must be the Bible school there. <laughs> and it wasn't. And uh, I didn't know anybody, and I had an unsaved 
home, unsaved family, and broke an old car and went in there. But 60 years later, I can say the lines that God extended to me are pleasant. And a lot of wonderful things have happened. Praise the Lord. And uh, like I said earlier, I had the Holy Ghost and I had a desire. Had a desire to do the will of the Lord. And uh, that, was, that was and is uh, a great possession that I had. When we arrived, there was no church here. And there was no smaller church, men's residence. And uh, our home church was on Argyle Street. Reverend E.L. Jakes was our pastor, and it was so huge compared to the little country church. And, and I think of the lines of God's providence that had fallen to me and allowed some wonderful people to come across my life. And uh, Tennyson said, I am part of all I have met. And uh, people would cross my life, preachers, Bible college, the instructors, the saints of the Lord, and they all left a little something for me to build on my heritage and, and ultimately to get my life in order and uh, have some sort of a, some sort of a heritage. And uh, I uh, today am very thankful for that. And I remember... Men like Brother Jakes uh, was the ultimate pastor and superintendent. He was the man that fathered our Bible college in 1955. And also the Harvey camp was pretty much his direction. And it came through a difficult time. But he became my pastor and a part of my heritage. And uh, his preaching, Brother Jakes' preaching, was uh, phenomenal. Many of you older people would remember Earl Jakes. And he always said, I've always parted my hair in the middle. And he said, I'm still doing it. And he didn't have any hair much. <laughs> and uh, and he, he died in 1961 at the age of 61. I'd come back to Bible college for my second year. And we started that year off with the funeral of brother Jake's and I remember the funeral service and I sat there so new and so young a teenager this huge man of God and in the sermon the pastor said who is going to get his mantle who's who will receive the mantle like Elijah's mantle came down and came to Elisha who is going to receive brother Jake's mantle and I went home and I studied that and I thought, what a wonderful, what a wonderful uh, heritage I have. I'm so blessed that the lines of God allowed people to cross my barren pathway and to enrich me. I remember one Sunday morning, he preached from the book of Esther. And I sat there in that morning service and Brother J Jakes preached about Esther and uh, the challenge that the Jews had and they were going to be exterminated and everything. And there was one person in Israel because of her beauty and her favor of the Lord, she had to appear before the king. And he said, uh, Brother Jakes reminded us again, if anybody goes before the king, unless they're invited, they will be they will be uh, killed. The king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come under the king into the inner court who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter that he may live. But I have not been called, she said. I have not been called to go to the king. And she told Mordecai, she said, I and my maidens will likewise fast, and who knows 
whether you are come to the kingdom such a time as this. Mordecai said, who knows, but you're come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And I mean, it was, it was death. She wasn't invited. And, and she went before the king, and he extended the scepter and brought deliverance to Israel. But she said these words, I also my maidens will fast likewise, and I will go into the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. And that was his text that day, if I perish, I perish. Those words wrote on my teenage heart of a, of a woman that had committed herself to the ways of the Lord, and I've never forgotten if I perish, I perish. And she went before the king and, and brought deliverance. That is, that is uh, the heritage that I have of being exposed to men, Brother Earl Jakes. I, uh, I think of my superintendents that I had. My first superintendent when I came in was Brother Jakes. And then Brother Wickens. Brother Wickens was... Uh, was my next superintendent. And Brother Wickens was a Christian. He was a Christian, and, and I love Brother Wickens, and he treated me fairly. I was a little bit wild. I was a little bit wild. One old pastor said, if I preached like you, I'd break a limb. <laughs> Brother Crocker from Campobello on it, if I preached like you, I'd break a limb. And, and Brother Wickens tried to settle me down, and... Uh, he said, one day I was flying at 35,000 feet, and the next day I'm in a six-foot trench at Harvey Camp putting a sewer line in, and Brother Wickens was the poorest paid uh, servant of the district, stayed in a little room out back, and, and I remember Brother Wickens leaving his wife and being out in back in that cold little room, and, uh, and I just... I just want to go on record today that Brother Wickens added something in the lines of God that fell across my life to make some sacrifices and to serve the Lord. Praise God. I thank God for the lines that have fallen across my way. And, uh, and I thank the Lord. Then Brother R.A. Beasley became our superintendent. And Brother, Brother Beasley... Uh, was, a, was an excellent pastor. And I would watch elders, I, I would watch elders, and I said, I want to be successful. I, I want to be a good, I want to tell you something. I was never called to be a general superintendent, nor much of anything else, but I felt I was called to be a pastor. And I said, if I'm a pastor, I want to be a good one, and I want to follow people that are good. And I would watch Brother Beasley walk down the aisle in Sussex, and reach out and slap somebody on the shoulder or to take a child's hand and so on. And, and I learned some things from Brother Beasley. And uh, so one day I sat down and I wrote to Brother Beasley, my superintendent, and I told him, I said, Brother Beasley, you are a good, you are a good superintendent and a good pastor. And I would like to be able to pastor like you. The lines of God fell upon a young teenage life Amen, and I'm so thankful for that. Praise God, I'm so thankful for that. And, and the saints in this church was on Argyle Street. And I, I remember Vinnie Peterson, the O'Donnell boys, and, and I, I remember uh, so many of them that became a part of, of my life and, and gave me uh, some heritage and I had able to work at that and work on my legacy. I want to have a legacy. When I stand before God and the church comes around to look at Brother Lewis, I want to have a legacy. 30 years ago, I went to the hospital over here in, in Fredericton. And I wanted to welcome my grandson into the world, Anthony Farrell. And he's a big old dude now, and he's working in the church out in Arkansas. And it was 30 years ago I walked in to see him. And, uh, and it touched me, and I saw that beautiful boy. 
And from there, I left and went on to Sussex, where A.W. Post was going to be buried. And uh, we lined up in the back. We lined up in the back, probably 75 or 80 ministers. And then we walked down the center aisle, and there the man of God was laid out before us. And when I got about six feet away, I could see Brother Post lying in the casket. And I got to remembering Brother Post and what he put in my life. Brother Post put a lot in my life. I remember hunting with him in a camp, and we were way out in the wilderness, and he loved to hunt. And uh, in the night, uh, he wanted to pray. And I can still hear Brother Post praying in tongues, whispering, wasn't loud. But he was laying in that cold bunk, and there he was praying and talking in tongues, whispering his prayer to the Lord. I never forgot that. I never forgot that. I never forgot his being a scholar. If you want to know about the Urim and the Thummim, and uh, if you want to know about Melchizedek and all of that, or original Greek words, Brother Post was a scholar. And uh, that fell across my pathway. That, that fell across my pathway, and I became very much influenced by A.W. Post. Amen. Praise the Lord. Aren't you thankful for the great people that have touched your life? Amen. Thank God for those who have come into our, into our lives. And now we today are standing here in this situation, this beautiful Memorial Day, Thanksgiving, and the lines have fallen in pleasant places. And he said, don't remove the ancient landmarks. Just honor. And uh, we do thank the Lord. I think of R.G. Priest. Brother Priest was a wonderful evangelist. He preached several weeks at our church. And I think 28 got the Holy Ghost. And he was big on the, on the oneness doctrine. And I thank God for the oneness message. There was a time that I couldn't understand, and I, I could get it boiled down. There was two. So I wasn't a Trinitarian. I was a Twinitarian. And I could get it down to two. And, and, and this is all right. I just want to say this. Brother Bill Stapley was working at the church as assistant pastor and and Brother Stapley came over and taught doctrine to the Bible college. And he got to teaching on the oneness. And he got talking about the dual nature of Jesus. And you need to ask the question, he said, when you quote Jesus, is he speaking as God or is he speaking as man? And immediately something opened to me and became a part of my heritage. I believe in this. I believe in this baptism in Jesus' name and the oneness of God. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm glad for the truth. I'm glad for the heritage. Amen. And I want to say how happy I am for this church, Pastor. When our Bible college students come here as a home church, we never have to worry. We never have to worry. That's wonderful. And this is, uh, this is a safe dwelling and we do appreciate it. Appreciate your opening your church to so many, so many uh, wonderful uh, uh, situations that have come to our district. And I, I appreciate men like W.J. Rolston. Brother Rolston came to Tilly from British Columbia, and he opened up a church there, and Brother Rolston believed in separation from the world. And and and. That got, into my, that got into my spirit too. I still think Christians ought to be Christians. And I think men need to be men and look like men and women not to, need to act like women. Isn't that awful to believe that? Amen. All this gender confusion. I'm glad that uh, my wife looks like a woman. And she acts like a woman, and I'm so thankful for her. And my girls, and I told my girls, if you're going to take part in this church, you're going to line up to this. 
I said it then and I said it now, a part of my heritage, I'm not about to sell out. I'm not about to sell out. I still believe. And Brother Rolston uh, came to Victoria County and he went to a camp meeting that the brethren had gotten together, Carlton, Victoria County, and went in and he found some of the dressing was not appropriate and Brother Rolston stood and he said, I am not going to endorse that my people get involved in this when you're doing contrary to what's being taught at the church. And he took his stand on separation and holiness. Praise God. I, I still got that church. And I can't let that go. Amen. As long as God gives me breath, I'm, I'm going to preach this message that the elders brought down to me as, as found in the word of the Lord. That's a heritage. Thank God for our heritage. What's this? And uh, he said, the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I, I am one of the most blessed people that you ever saw. And I am not sour and I am not bitter. But I am so thankful for the truth that was brought to me uh, so many years ago. Praise God. I uh, will send a picture. Maybe I'll mention C.B. Dudley first. You can't forget C.B. Dudley. Brother Dudley preached half of the services at camp meeting. And one of the evangelists got up and he said, I think I should give Brother Dudley half the offering because he did half the preaching. And he would, he would shout out and so on. So this guy was preaching one day about the, from the 20th chapter of Acts. And he preached about Eutychus. And he said, Paul was preaching and Eutychus fell asleep in, in Acts chapter 20. And Eutychus fell out of the third story window, the third loft. And it was as his neck break, and it fell down on the ground. And somebody said to Paul, was preaching, and said that Eutychus has just fallen out of the window. And Paul went down. The Bible says he fell on him, and they got him up and brought him up, and they had a lunch. And the service continued on around midnight. And uh, so this man was preaching about it, and he said, if that happened today... He said, we'd go looking for a shovel. We'd go looking for a shovel. Brother Dudley came to his feet. I beg your pardon, sir. If somebody's neck broke, I'm not going to go looking for a shovel. The same God that Paul served is able to serve us, and he's here today, and I'm going to claim the promise. Brother Dudley was just that kind of a man, and that got into my spirit. Amen. There was a, I don't know if this is what you folks wanted or not, but it's what you're going to get. <laughs> they had on King Street over here, uh, they were opening a store and they had a hypnotist. And he was up on the sidewalk and he was going to hypnotize and going to do such and such. And Brother Dudley was going by. And Brother Dudley walked over to him and he said, Sir, I want to tell you that there are two powers in the world. There's the power of God and there's the power of the devil. And he said, This is not the power of God. And, and Brother Dudley stood up to him and somebody said, you, sh you got no right to do that. He said, Our boys fought in the war and the old Union Jack's still flying and I guess I still got liberty to say what I believe. You say, Brother Dudley, or Brother Lewis, that, that's not, you shouldn't do that. Oh, is that right? Well, that's the line that fell across this young preacher here, and I still got it. <laughs> Hallelujah, I still got it. <laughs> Brother Dudley was in a, Brother Dudley was in a, a, a funeral possession, and they were in the graveyard, and this uh, lady fell on the ground in the heat and she fainted and the denominational preacher didn't know what to do. He didn't know what to do. Here she is lying on the ground in the cemetery and Brother Dudley went over to him and he said, Sir, 
would you mind, I know this woman, would you mind if I prayed for her? Well, it wasn't in his book, so he said, sure, go ahead. It's not in my book. They didn't teach us that. Brother Dudley looked down to her and said, Sister Nellie, on the authority of God's word and the power of the name of Jesus, I command you to arise. And took her by the hand and she stood up. <laughs> Hallelujah. You say, Brother Lewis, do you think that's right? I think we need a whole lot more of that. We don't need more formality. We need more of the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. I think of these men that uh, came into my life and that I love and appreciate. I think of had a picture sent to me this past week of C.M. Becton. Brother C.M. Becton was a Mr. Articulation. He, every hair in place, and he was, he was just impeccable. And, uh, and what a preacher. And uh, he was, would be moved on by the Spirit, dancing in the Spirit, but he was a real professional, classy piano player and just, just one of my heroes. Somebody sent me a picture of him. And uh, I always loved Brother Becton and went to his service in Wy Wyoming Street in uh, Nashville. We went down and went into his church. And uh, he said, were you folks at the Grand Ole Opry last night? And I said, no, sir. I wasn't at the Grand Ole Opry last night, but I am here today. And he said, a lot of people come and testify. We was to the Grand Ole Opry last night. And Brother Becton said, that we never did endorse that. And, uh, and so walked in and Brother uh, Becton got up and very intelligently, he said, my topic this morning is on spiritual vertigo. And I sat right up. I said, now this fellow knows where he's going, spiritual vertigo or spiritual dizziness. And he told the story of landing on a plane in London, England with his wife. And they were, uh, they were enveloped in dense fog and it was not good at all. And he said, that plane can get so confusing that whether you're on your side or where it's going or anything, you can't. Know. But he said, there's one thing you couldn't visibly judge it, but you had to go by the instruments. And uh, he said, those pilots would go by the instruments if they could see where they were going or not, but they knew the instruments. And he held the old book up and he said, I want to announce to this church, this is the flight plan to heaven and held the Bible up and he said, this is going to tell us whether we're flying upside down or whether we're off track. And, uh, and he preached on spiritual vertigo and we always had a little thing about, uh, about big, big words. He got off the plane one time and they had some turbulence and the pilot came on and gave a word and he told me, but he said, I knew Brother Lewis would love this word and, and I thought for days on trying to find out that word and I can't remember it. But whenever I'd meet Brother Beckton, I would mention about this big word and uh, that he would, he would talk about uh, very knowledgeable and, and, and I got to tell you folks, I, I, I like it. I like it when a preacher dresses up and I like it when a preacher combs his hair and I like it when a preacher gets his gerunds all straightened out and no double negatives and don't end a sentence with a preposition. I say, where are you going to? You don't show where you're going to. He says, where are you going? Drop the two. And, and I, I like grammatical excellence and uh, and I, and I like that, and Brother Becton had that, and you say, well, Brother Lewis, what's important about that? Well, I'll tell you what, that's part of my heritage. That's part of my heritage, and I'm not going to drop it. I, I still got the Dudley, and I still got the priest, and I still got the Rolston, and I'd like to have a little more of, uh, of Brother Becton. He would talk about the DNA, the DNA and the gene pool, DNA deoxyribonucleic acid and I didn't know what DNA was had to do with the gene pool and I met somebody a while ago and I said to my wife I said uh, there's not many fish in the gene pool there I don't think <laughs> uh, 
I don't think there's any fish in that gene pool. <laughs> Amen. And uh, I was talking to one pastor. He's a doctor. And, and we were talking. And he said something about serendipity. And I thought, you are totally ignorant, Harry Lewis. You, you've got to firm up a little bit. And, and I've, I've had some wonderful people with lines that came across my pathway and it was pleasant, and I, I love my heritage, amen. And he used the word serendipity. That just means it's a surprisingly good thing that's happened. And uh, I'll tell you what, this is serendipity that we drove in here this morning, and I have this wonderful privilege, might never come back again. You know, at my age, at my age, you don't know. We don't know. I, I, walk, I walk up in the woods, and I do quite a lot of walking, and... And, and I said, maybe you're just going to fall over. I don't want cancer. And uh, if it's going to be a nice big heart attack, I wouldn't mind going like that. And, and I, I think about uh, going up in the woods. But I know no matter how I go, I want a legacy. I want a legacy. When the preachers come down the aisle and look at Brother Lewis, they'll say that he wasn't a failure and he didn't quit. He didn't quit, and he, he held on, and he stood for the principles of elders, and he stood on the heritage. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. My wife said, you shouted and waved your arms back 60 years ago. I know it, and I'm still doing it. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. And uh, I, uh, we had a little issue a little issue at conference. I don't know what time you get through here. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be through in just a few moments. I didn't realize it was this late. Uh, I, uh, I, remember, I remember my heart so reaching out after God. And I wanted to pattern after God. Good men. Amen. And, and I didn't want to be a failure. And I'm going to say this. The last time I was in this church, I sat over here. And it was the uh, memorial service for Brother Raymond Woodward. And I am uh, not doing this for political advantage. And I sat over there, and I was not pressured to have any part. And I watched that service, and I got a call from a brother in Edmonton afterward, and he said, I've been and watching that service. And I said, I have never been in a more qualified service. And uh, here's an elder. Here's an elder that served well, served his church, and served pastors. And now people are gathering by the scores to give honor to Brother Raymond Woodward Sr. And, uh, and I will say this. I will say this. I'm very proud and thankful for your pastor. And I'm thankful for the ministry that God's given to him. But Brother Woodward, you got it honorably. You had somebody that passed it on to you. Amen. And then I watched a grandson and, and the daughters, and I watched the church staff giving their love and appreciation. I preached a few times in this church and been here, but I got to make a confession. When I sat on this platform, I would scan the audience, and I would look to see if Brother Woodward is here. I wonder if Brother Woodward, Sister Woodward's here. And I was scan. you say, why would you do that? A lot of people here, Brother Lewis, why are you looking? Because he had my attention, and I knew he'd appreciate what I was trying to say and respected me. I was sitting over here one day, and I was superintendent, a superintendent for 10 years. Now, that's, a, that's another job. I often said two things I wouldn't want to be. One's a preacher's wife, and I wouldn't want to be a superintendent again, and I don't think I ever will. 
And uh, Brother Woodward made his way from over here over to where I was. And we had been going through some few little things. And uh, he shook my hand and he said, Brother Lewis, I just want to tell you that, that I believe in you and I believe you're doing a good job. I hung on to that as if that was the only life raft in that ocean. And I knew he meant it. I knew he meant it. And I stood there. And I, the scripture, and he brought forth after his kind. And uh, he left a heritage. He left a heritage to his family and to the church. And uh, I appreciate that so much. Praise God. God bless you, precious people, today. I, I want to say this in closing. I uh, I want to get my I want to get my life right, and I want to, I just want to have uh, everything in line. So when it comes time for Brother Lewis to go, that they can say that he had a legacy. I want to tell you something. Twelve, fifteen years ago, I retired from pastoring in Perth. And uh, my son-in-law came along and my daughter, and they're doing a great job. And then I started to finish my ministry, and I told Brother Farrell, I said, I'm somewhere between third base and home. He said, you've been there for 15 years. <laughs> I'm somewhere between third base and home. And uh, sooner or later, I want you to take over, and he did. But you know what I'm doing today? I'm pastoring a little church in New Denmark, 25 people. And I go up there every Sunday, twice, and I stand before them. I got a preacher for them this morning and for the service tonight. You say, what are you, what are you, why are you doing that? Why don't you just get rid of that? Those people can't afford a pastor right now. And I want to be a blessing to them. Amen. I, uh, I want to leave a legacy that people can go by and say, well, nobody else wanted to help us. Brother Lewis was there to help us. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'll tell you one story in closing. And uh, I didn't always have a good legacy I just started to serve the Lord and this is going to be for people that may be watching and you don't know how it's going to end up with you uh, I had given my heart to the Lord and we were brought up rough and uh, I was driving a truck one day God was dealing with me and and the devil kept telling me, you can't serve the Lord because you'll be a hypocrite. You'll make a mistake and you'll be a hypocrite. And I didn't want to be a hypocrite. I wanted to serve the Lord and wanted to do it all right. And I wanted a legacy that looked right. I wanted a Raymond Woodward legacy. And uh, I was working and driving this truck and it got onto wet pavement and slippery. And that truck went sideways. And I went down the road sideways, headed toward a big car, probably a car from St. John. And it was a big car, and that truck was going. And I was just newly giving my heart to the Lord when that old life and in my fear and quick, I said something. I didn't take the name of the Lord in vain, but I said something that was bad. And the devil jumped on me in that truck and said, see, you can't serve the Lord. You tried and you've made your mistakes and, and you're, just, uh, you're just nothing but a hypocrite. I was learning to play the guitar and I took my guitar to church and I'd sit where I could watch the pastor. And when he would move his fingers, I could move mine. I sat right over here. And so I, I came home from that situation of that truck and the bad thing that I said.
defeated and the devil was after me and said, you failed God. You failed the Lord. And I came to the church and I got my guitar and I took my guitar home and I said, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I'm going to take my guitar home and, and I can't live it. And that night in the church, I came over on this side, left my guitar. The people noticed I wasn't playing. And I was over there and I was crying. And one of the elders of the church came to me and said, Harry, you're not having a very good day. And, and I was crying. Poor, poor little fella. You know, we, we ought to be compassionate to people. We don't know what they're going through. And I'd made a mistake and the devil was kicking me all over the place. He knelt down beside me and I was weeping. And he said, I want to give you a scripture. It's from the book of John, 1 John, 1 John 2 and 1. My little children, I write unto you that you sin not. But if you sin, you've got an advocate to the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he said, you've got You've got a defense. You've got an attorney. When you make a mistake and you, you do something and the devil jumps on you and holds that against you, you just get on your face and repent and tell God you're sorry. And when God looks at you, he sees you through the blood. He sees you not as a evil. He sees you as one of his children. And you can get up. <sighs> The old prophet said, Micah chapter 7, verse 8, he said, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I'll get up again. And when I set in darkness, the Lord will be a light unto me. Amen. In the book of Proverbs, it says, Proverbs 24, 16, The just man falls seven times, but he gets back up again. If I'm preaching to somebody here or some other place today, I want you to know that if you made a mistake, if you made a mistake, the devil will tell you that there's no use of trying. You need to go to work on your heritage. You need to go to work on your, on your life and get things all ready because one day we're going to stand before the Lord. Amen. And God has allowed great people to come into our lives Amen. And I can't forget the great men that came into my life. And I want to have a legacy. I want my son, when he comes by at my viewing, I want him to look at and say, my dad was a Christian. My dad was a Christian. And I don't want, to, I don't want anything to mar that testimony. And I, the Lord is... is uh, has given me counsel, my reins instruct me in the night seasons. Amen. When he sees me, I'm wondering if we could sing that little chorus. When he sees me, he sees the blood of the Lamb. All of these years and all of the mistakes I've made, I would just call upon the Lord. I would never justify. Amen. If I had, if I had some problems, I've apologized to district superintendents. I've apologized to Brother Reed at the Bible school and just didn't, I just didn't want anything. I don't want anything to stand in my way. I want a legacy. I want to appreciate my heritage and all the godly people that came into my life. And, uh, and if I make mistakes, I'm going to come back. And that night at that church, I lifted my hands and I said, look on me, Lord, through the blood of Jesus. He sees me as worthy and not as I am. Have you made a mistake this morning? Look, I, I do this all the time. If I go to a funeral, I have to somehow work in a word for the Lord and for somebody that the devil's trying to destroy. Amen. You're too, you're too good to be lost. You're too good to go to hell. Amen. God's put people in your life and in my life. And my heritage, 
the lines have fallen in pleasant places. Thank you, Brother Post. Thank you, Brother Jakes. Thank you, Brother Beckton. Hallelujah. Still planning to make it by the grace of the Lord. I wonder if we could stand, please. I'm going to turn it back to the pastor. Amen. Amen. Heritage and legacy and being ready to meet the Lord. Praise God. Could we sing this chorus, please?